What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health, an affiliate of Mad in America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and the Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at madinamerica.com. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, my guest is Rachel Jane Liebert. Rachel is a PhD lecturer in psychology at the University of East London in the UK. She collaborates with artists and activists on decolonizing and feminist work around madness and whiteness. Her new book is Psychurity, Colonialism, Paranoia, and the War on Imagination. So welcome to Madness Radio, Rachel Jane Liebert. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really interested in your work and your book, Psychurity, is quite remarkable. It brings together both a careful and detailed critique of what's called the early psychosis movement or the early psychosis intervention approach in psychology, which is trying to treat madness at its earliest or even, you know, preventing it from happening. It combines a critique of that along with a larger political understanding and also an, a spiritual and a very creative and artistic understanding. So it's a very remarkable book and I encourage people to check it out. Mm, thank you. How did you get interested in these topics? You grew up in New Zealand, which is a colonized country. And so I imagine these issues were very um, alive for you in your life growing up. And then how did you get interested in psychology and specifically in looking at um, the new approaches, the emerging approaches that are happening around psychosis? Well, uh, I, I mean, when I was back in New Zealand doing my kind of undergraduate degree in psychology, I was extremely disappointed in my experiences. Um, in fact, I dropped out. I remember saying to people at the time that I felt like psychology took the human out of being human. And then I kind of reluctantly went back and finished it and just kind of wrote, learned everything and just kind of got, got, got out of there as quickly as I could. I just, I got into psychology because I was really curious about and really into just people generally, just how different we all are in people's stories, lives, how we affect each other. And then when I was in the university, it felt like everyone just got reduced to a category um, sometimes a kind of theoretical category, sometimes a diagnosis, and that our job was just to memorize not only that name of that category, but the name of the person who first designated it in the year that they did so. Uh -huh. And it just felt like a very soulless way of engaging with people. And so, yeah, so I, I got out of there, I got through it and got out of there as soon as I could. And and jumped into working in community mental health um, and it's by absolute fluke i ended up being the assistant the admin assistant to the senior consumer advisor of a large uh, ngo nonprofit in auckland and she and i at that time i had not heard the term consumer before and to be quite frank with you right up until beginning the job I thought that it meant that my role was something to do with marketing, actually. <laughs> um, and then, but I just wanted to get my foot in the door. And, it's and kind of actually, a, it's yeah. kind of a, it's kind of a jargon term. But when the sort of uh, psychiatry or mental health world talks about consumers, what they mean is people who've been patients who are in that role of someone who's receiving services and has a diagnosis. And I think the the term consumer was used because it's considered an improvement over the word client, which was considered an improvement over the word patient, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Like, that's, that's what I came to find out. Mm -hmm. And so my, my boss uh, was someone who had been a patient client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and my job was to uh, su support her and making sure the voices of people who use the services were heard and responded mm -hmm. to. So, so I, I, my first job actually in mental health was was one that where people who were mad were my peers and advisors and colleagues and and teachers and that kind of set me on a very distinct path in terms of doing this work 
I mean, I just got to, I got to hang out with people and yeah, and, and yeah, learn from their experiences and stories. And then at the same time, through those experiences and stories, I, I started to get much more of a sense of the, the politics of people's experiences and the kind of injustice that people went through. Um, and also including actually in the service that I was working with them. So I actually became very politicized. And then my next job, I kind of shifted on to be working uh, for another mental health organization, but one that was much more focused on working with communities and in particular doing anti-discrimination work around madness. And through that, usually that, gets, work, that usually gets called yeah. like anti-stigma campaigns and that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And so suddenly, so suddenly I was part of what could be, had the potential to be, and I still think they do have the potential to be, quite kind of radical movements to challenge this discrimination. But we found ourselves, so I, I started, I was co-facilitating a youth group for young people, young adults who were using mental health services. And we, we were called Vibe. And, um, and we kind of put together these workshops to go out in the community and yeah, and challenge discrimination around madness. And in doing so, we found that we had to challenge the dominance of this kind of medical script um, that was kind of one that we were kind of expected to roll out ourselves because that was seen to reduce discrimination. Uh, and, and two, that obviously the people who came to our workshops were holding quite tightly onto. So very quickly, that, that work became about kind of challenging medicalization, but also because it was in the context of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and a lot of the people we worked with were uh, indigenous people and who were also helping us to pull together these workshops, we started to kind of tie together medicalization and colonization. And so I think that's how I first started to kind of orient myself to thinking in terms of taking a kind of decolonizing approach to psychology. And, and we're talking like 15 years ago, that kind of thing. Because it's New Zealand, it really foregrounded the way in which would you say that psychiatry and this kind of medical model approach has been a colonizing force, that it really advances the interests of, of racism and white supremacy as part of the whole um, medical narrative and the, the idea that, you know, this is how we're treating people, this is what's best for people, this is what, how we're helping people, but actually it's just another form of colonialism? Yeah, I would. And in terms of like it planted the seeds and certainly thinking about it as not in terms of it's colonizing, in terms of it using colonizing as a metaphor, but actually no, it, it is actually rolling out these colonial dynamics. Um, yeah, that, are, that is creating a kind of white privilege, white supremacy in New Zealand and also sh like shutting out a whole lot of experiences. Um, that, because yeah. Because we, um, because we tend to think of medicine as benevolent, that we're here to help people, that it's about caring, that it's about offering beneficial services, it's about the interests of the people who are suffering. But then if we look at the history of colonialism, that's actually what Christianity was doing all throughout <laughs> colonialism. The, the people who arrived in New Zealand weren't necessarily, I'm sure some of them were, but I'm, they weren't necessarily motivated by a hatred and an explicit kind of wanting to destroy a culture, they felt themselves as a modernizing or civilizing or Christianizing force for good. And I think that's one of the things that we have to remember that often the worst kinds of violence and evil are done in the name of help and caring and doing mm. good in the world. Mm. I know. Yeah. As you started speaking, the, the first thing to come to my mind was like, yeah, they, those are my, those were my very helpful ancestors who on my mother's side were missionaries who, and so they, they colonized, they helped to colonize Aotearoa New Zealand in the, in the name of, of good and the, and the civil. Uh, and so, yeah, so I, that's something for, for me, keeping my kind of ancestral lines close is really important in doing this work. Uh, especially, you know, as a kind of white person myself, it's like, how do I make sure that I'm just not being a white savior? How do I make sure that I'm just not kind of helping in a, in a way that's, um, that's ignoring the kind of agency of the people that I work with or my own kind of complicity in, in coloniality? Yeah, the white savior image and the doctor as savior are very closely related. Mm. I mean, it does. It... Yeah, I think that really resonates.
So when we talk about questioning and challenging uh, white privilege and patriarchy and male dominance in psychology, we're not just talking about having more doctors who are people of color or having more psychiatrists who are women. There's something much deeper that's going on here. Mm. Yeah, I think there's something much deeper. I mean, certainly there is an issue of like kind of the whitening of the profession. Certainly that's what we see at the University of East London and in the UK more broadly. Uh, people of colour getting, who are very keen to get involved in clinical psychology, getting kind of pushed out as as they move up through academia. However, yeah, there's there's other there are other things going on. Uh, and... Yeah, and part of that is looking at our kind of how our diagnostic categories, how our diagnostic practices are themselves um, enacting these kind of colonial dynamics. And how does that how does that work? I mean, I think that there's a very interesting connection between what gets defined as normal and what are the expected behaviors of a white man. That that being white and male sort of creates the definition of what it is to be mentally healthy and to be mentally normal if they're actually very closely related uh, standards. Yeah, yeah. And that can be traced back to and through colonization. I mean, there's a um, Caribbean philosopher who I'm really influenced by, who named Sylvia Winter. And she talks about how the kind of colon, the, the core of colonization is what she calls the de-supernaturalization of our modes of being human. Uh, and that Western intellectuals kind of went out from the 15th century, went out into, from Europe, kind of went out into um, the, like parts of what we now know as Asia and Africa and, and Oceania, and, uh, and kind of started to declare like a certain kind of rationality as, as, the, as the superior kind of rationality. And that is one you know, where we are not enslaved in her terms to our emotions, uh, where we're cut off from our bodies, where we're cut off from the land, uh, cut off from each other. And instead we kind of slowly, it's like our whole being moves up into the mind. Um, and, and it's from there that we just kind of can kind of know and control the world. And so anyone who deviates from that uh, is, is eventually considered mad and treated as mad. And that's so that's and, and to me that's where kind of um, where kind of psychiatric survivor movements and mad justice movements really align so importantly with um, kind of black resistance movements, feminist movements, indigenous movements, because that kind of that certain kind of man with a capital M, rational knowing man, was absolutely gendered, absolutely raced, uh, absolutely classed. And so all, any kind of bodies that, that represented another way of being in the world were, well, well I mean, they were literally kind of murdered and wiped out. And how has this played out in terms of your own questioning, your own uh, role in all this? Because you're someone who has white privilege, your ancestry um, includes missionaries, colonists who are really perpetrating uh, this this violence. And so you know, you and I both are implicated in this. How, how has it worked out for you personally and kind of struggling with this um, legacy of your ancestry that you have? Well, as I move, so, so yeah, the, the kind of the, the origin story of me doing this work that I kind of spoke of earlier was, yeah, 15 years ago. And so from there, I, uh, I ended up doing um, a master's um, project, research project, it took a couple of years where I looked at the role of the pharmaceutical industry in constructing ideas of normality and uh, in particular how they kind of erased um, evidence of adverse effects from antidepressants, how they can make us suicidal and aggressive. Uh, and so I kind of, so I became interested in, yeah, this kind of corporate co-optation of what counts as mad and what counts as normal. And through that, I ended up joining a PhD program that was very committed to social justice, and it was in psychology in, in New York. And a lot of people who join that program at the, it's at the City University of New York are uh, activists. And so once I was there, I became um, very much involved in activism, and um, and because of the what was going on in the world, it was kind of 
9-11 still felt really recent uh, in particular, but mm. also because of the kind of increasing police brutality and, and general kind of anti-blackness, a lot of the um, activism that I got involved in was anti-racist work. And so I got very schooled in thinking about my own whiteness from doing that work. Um, so as I shifted, I kind of, as I quite reluctantly ended up moving to the UK um, to take up this job, um, not because I wanted the job, but I didn't want to live in the UK. I decided that if I really want to start committing to doing decolonizing work, then I now was my chance actually to look into my own ancestry because my ancestors, some of them came from the UK. And as you, like you said, they're very complicit in colonization. So they were not just missionaries who helped to roll out this kind of cosmological violence um, across the world, but they were also, uh, they also came to be an actual militia in New Zealand. So leading massacres against Māori in order to steal land. And so that's, that's been the last two years uh, I've been spending as much time as I can looking into my own ancestry uh, and trying yeah, to hold my ancestors close as a way to keep me accountable in doing this work. Because as you said earlier, they did this thinking that it, they did, they committed violence thinking it was the right thing. Um, sometimes thinking that they were helping. And so I need to also be aware that I could be making similar mistakes. And so, and so for me, that means being as attuned as possible to the effects of what I do to be, to listen all the time to people's kind of responses you know, to learn and just to take kind of as, I guess as kind of humble and experimental a position as I can yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in your new book, Psychurity, what you've done is kind of focus on one aspect of uh, contemporary psychiatry and psychology, which is is this interest in treating and helping people seen as psychotic, but in the very very early stages. There's a bunch of research that's called the prodromal. Uh, stage. It's it's like a fancy way of saying um, earliest, the mm -hmm. moments when you start to get symptoms before you have symptoms. So in other words, psychiatry is interested in treating people who are in a crisis, but it's also interested in people who are not in a crisis, but they think, they think are going to be in a crisis mm -hmm. at some point in the future. And this has a lot of problems with it because it kind of expands the uh, the net. It expands the reach of psychiatric services, again, in the name of helping people and being preventative and supporting people at the early stages. But as your book really points out, it has this incredible dark side. So tell us about the Psychurity book and your kind of focus on this prodromal early psychosis question. Mm. Yeah, at the time when I started doing the research, it was 9-11 was very much in the air. I mean, it was it was about 10 years post 9-11. Uh, but um, living in New York, it was very much in the everyday kind of landscape where every every time I kind of left the, the building. And so I, w I became really curious into how these kind of politics of terror were moving through these new approaches to madness and in particular to psychosis, because there was this language of kind of preventing these future threats and therefore having to put in place these, these security measures that were seen to be very, very logical. I mean, they're not only seen to kind of save money over time, but as you said, they, they were seen to be, with regards to madness, they were seen to be as particularly kind of compassionate because they're preventing people from any pending kind of pain and, and trauma. Um, so this to me was just, it was echoing with, um, with well, I think in particular of the kind of Homeland Security slogan, if you see something, say something. And actually that slogan started to come through uh, when I started to look into this prodromal movement. So I remember there was, uh, I started to do kind of an ethnography of, of these, these shifts to identify and intervene on psychosis. And before it became a problem, is the way people described it. So what you're saying is that, in a sense, society perceives a threat, 
and it's a threat from the terrorists, but it's also a threat from the psychotic person. Yeah. It's basically the same kind of framing of fear and danger and threat. And so just like there's a law enforcement and military approach to perceiving when terrorism might be starting at its early stages, there's also a whole psychology psychiatry approach, which is looking for when madness will begin at its early stages. Because the idea is that, okay, the mad person, the one who's psychotic is the one who's going to go off and do a school shooting or, you know, kill people or attack people. But of course, you know, the whole society is full of people who are in emotional distress. The whole society isn't full of people who are interested in, in radical terrorist politics. So it's kind of like an easier target to start looking for in the general population the danger because you're not finding it elsewhere you're finding it among mad people well yeah and also the i i mean what i became interested in was how this kind of movement was helping to defend kind of america and i say that in inverted commas it, america itself uh, because what i was noticing was that when there were these shootings mass shootings that were happening like for example the dylan roof shooting which i talk about in the book it happened mm. in 2015 mm. uh, in charleston uh, where nine uh, dylan roof was a young white man who walked into a black church and shot nine people to death and he explicitly mm. did it in the name of white supremacy and wanting to start a race war and yet if we look at the media representations and the court representations of dylan roof there is a very concerted effort to try and locate his uh, actions as madness and in fact as paranoia mm. uh, and so so Dylan Roof kind of and th those actions of those kind of white supremacist shooters just like the white supremacist shooter that just um, that just walked into a mosque in Christchurch New Zealand and shot 50 people they there's a concerted effort to try and frame that person as an as an individual mad person because that stops us from looking at these cultures of coloniality of patriarchy of militarism that actually create the conditions of possibility for those shootings in the first place so i i mm. said i was interested in how things this supposedly objective prodromal science was playing a role in these much bigger um very very violent politics and one one kind of uh, one thing that stood out to me uh, and has stuck with me was looking back over kind of some archives and finding George Bush's response to 9-11 all, all the way back in um, 2001 mm -hmm. and how he actually names kind of mental health and this kind of intervention work in mental health as he talks about pulling together soldiers and the armies of compassion to kind of, to make America a better place for people with disabilities, including people considered to have mental health issues. And so, and he's saying that as a response to 9-11. So it's like, yeah. So he, these, there was this connection that seemed to be brewing and I wanted in my book to kind of dive into that. Hmm. And, and as part of that, you did some very close on the ground work with um, looking at what clinics around early psychosis are doing and the kinds of training and the kinds of language that we're doing, because we, we should say that this is something that's happening throughout the United States. It's actually being generalized as a model around the world that, you know, yeah. there are these young people, and if we get them help early, then we can prevent them having more of a crisis later. And it sounds good, and I think there, there is some truth. Obviously, you want to give help early. There's no objection to that, but it, you're saying that it's been twisted into this kind of almost paranoid military security response of controlling, anticipating, preventing, and controlling the danger to society. And, and of course, the treatments that are offered aren't compassionate, community-based listening. They're medications and control and hospitalization and go on a disability check and, and come under the um, care of these kind of surveillance uh, institutions where you're involved with the program and they're monitoring your behavior and your activity and it's all done in the name of support but with an eye towards seeing whatever difference you may have or whatever unusual thing that you may have in your presentation or whatever kind of difficult emotion you might be presenting with an eye to seeing that 
in terms of, oh, this is your mental illness. This is your disease. We have to prevent this. We have to control it. Mm. Yeah, and and so I did. I I wanted to be to get right into the laboratories of this kind of prodromal science and mm -hmm. to learn what they did, to learn the kind of the cogs of this is how I come to talk about them in my book and detail the cogs. Mm -hmm. So I uh, I contacted a few prodromal clinics on the east coast and ended up spending time with one in particular and uh, and kind of shadowed one of their lead. Um, coordinators of the of the research, and that involved me first of all going um, and kind of watching as she did a presentation at a school to um, the kind of counselors and teachers and, the, and administrative staff about how what kind of signs they might look out for in young people who are potentially psychotic. So again, it's the if you see something, say something kind of yeah. mentality. Yeah. And the idea is that you report the person. You see that they're acting potentially distressed or they've got something unusual. And then you, you report them to the authorities. But in this context, it's the mental health professionals. Yeah, in this case, the authority is the the university that houses this research clinic. And so there was a, you know, everything is kind of ostensibly done in the name of research because they don't have permission to be to be calling themselves what they do treatment um, mm -hmm. and they and certainly when they would go out into schools there was a very very strong building of kind of a, a fear and yeah paranoia about these these young people uh, and and a, and and please they really felt like please for, for anything to anything even if this is how she spoke about it she's like no matter how small if you have any suspicion about a young person please call us please call us and then what would happen is yeah people would call uh, and then young people would be referred to this clinic where they would go through a screening process to see whether or not they might be prodromal so again, prodromal means potentially psychotic. Potentially, mm -hmm. psychotic. it's a little bit yeah. like a it's a little bit like a thought crime. Like you haven't really done the crime yet, but you're thinking about it, and so we're going to predict you're going to do it. So we're going to intervene on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I um, then I participated in a training day for to learn how to actually do this screening of young people. And usually it's a training that takes, I think, two or three days, but which in itself is remarkably short. <laughs> but they yeah. put together a special one-off, one-day training um, for some people from uh, Santiago, actually, in Chile, who were starting the first prodromal clinic in their country. And so, so this is how kind of how, how much this kind of U.S. movement is starting to to get out into the world. Uh, this kind of imperial force, and so uh, during the training, yeah, I kind of documented uh, how kind of young people pulled in for the supposedly banal quite benevolent screening were actually made prodromal I really believe that actually that these these kind of objective measures weren't just kind of representing people's experiences but they were actually turning people's experiences into something that was a problem how do you see that operating because it's almost like an expectation effect that happens that the people just get brought in and then they're expected to behaving a certain way and then they end up fulfilling that expectation. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of very kind of subtle ways that all kind of came together. Uh, so one um, is in terms of like the kind of the screening questionnaire that's used mm -hmm. uh, is kind of is structured because that's seen meaning that they ask the same questions in the same order every single time with every single young person. And that seemed to be more quote unquote scientific because it seemed to remove kind of any bias of the, of the person who's doing the screening. However, what that does is it actually um, kind of bullies people's experiences into these predetermined categories because effectively people need to start answering yes or no to all these questions. So as I, I kind of watched, there's one training video we got given towards the end of the day and it, and where we saw kind of our facilitator going through this process with a young person, or she was an, an actor, but yeah, to give us kind of a sense of what happened with a real life patient, because they were calling people patients. And, uh, and yeah, you could just see it kind of happening. It was just like, it was like, at, at the time I was also 
or I had been sitting in actually on a court trial against the um, NYPD for being racist. And it, I was, and it was a very similar process. It's like the way the kind of questioning is done, it's this kind of like interrogation of the young person. And mm. in such a way that ultimately it felt like they had no place to go except to, to become prodromal. What were some of the kinds of questions that they're asking in these interviews of, of young people to sort of detect uh, incipient uh, psychosis lurking around the person? Well, in this video, the questions that were asked, and they, these are direct kind of word for word from the screening instrument that people use, is have you had the feeling that something odd is going on or that something is wrong that you can't explain? Have you ever been confused at times whether something you have experienced is real or imaginary? Do familiar people or surroundings ever seem strange? Uh, does your experience of time seem to have changed? Do you ever seem to live through events exactly as you have experienced them before? And those, those ones, for example, are all considered to kind of tap into whether or not people have what's, what they call unusual thought content or delusional ideas. And then that would be formed as the basis of saying, well, we really think you need treatment, which essentially means medication and getting a... <laughs> a diagnosis of potentially having a psychotic disorder or maybe even schizophrenia or bipolar disorder? Well, actually, from there, it's not, this is what they try and take a lot of care around. So from there, it's not um, you need treatment. From there, it's like, oh, welcome into our study where we're going to we're going to just kind of document your experiences and collect data because we're trying to work out whether or not we can predict psychosis. But what happens is that from that moment on, once people have been kind of determined by what I, I call these border guards to kind of be prodromal and kind of brought into this, 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 ter this prodromal kind of territory, then they start to talk to people as though they have a mental illness. So they talk to people about their illness, that they use that language, they call them patients. Um, and mm. they start, and at this point, on, this is when they start to use the word psychosis with people. So before then, they say that they don't want to use the word psychosis because it can scare off people from participating in the screening. Hmm. But as soon as they've kind of made them prodromal, assembled them as prodromal, then they immediately start to use this very, very medical language. And, and what I come to think about is how the use of this language actually works as a kind of custody. It kind of holds people within the kind of care of the clinic, because suddenly people obviously become afraid of themselves and of this kind of this, this potential future that they're told will come if they don't participate in these kind of in treatments. And so the, the, the prodromal clinics, they're not allowed to say that they give treatment. They have to say that they're just giving research, but effectively, they talk actually quite openly that they're actually working ultimately to try and treat people. And once people start becoming treated, then they kind of move, start to kind of, they, they, it's almost like they're kind of, their psyches and their bodies become attuned to being, this idea of being psychotic. And people have to spit in test tubes, they have to go through brain scans, they have to uh, make all these kind of lifestyle interventions and eventually yeah black pe some people are put on antipsychotics and it's all in the name of kind of research and maybe maybe this is because you might be prodromal um, but ultimately they kind of come to I think convince psyches and bodies that they are prodromal and that psychosis is right there. So you're talking about something that happens throughout the mental health system is the socialization into a new identity, that you've been a mm. normal, ordinary particip participant in the community, but now you gradually, slowly get drawn in to where you have a new self-understanding, where actually you see yourself as different. You see yourself as psychotic or as prodromally psychotic, and then that ends up starting to, to change who you are, and you become the very thing that you're being expected to be. Well, yeah, and there's like, again, there's kind of these small, like, but very concrete and powerful kind of moments within in the clinic where you see this happening. So one is a very kind of well-known trope, which is that if, if people start to 
not want to take medication and not want to be involved in kind of treatment, then that's seen as a symptom actually of like their lurking psychosis. Yeah, it's and, considered a kind of paranoia. Like, why don't you trust us? What, yeah. we're, we're just trying to help you. Why are you, why are you resisting this offer of, you know, why are you not having insight into um, what's really going on here? And then you very quickly get a polarization that just fuels the whole paranoia dynamic. Yeah, exactly. So it's this, spi this spiraling starts to happen. And spir spirals become a very central motif in the book. It's like how we get pulled into these spirals. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that image of the floor kind of falling open beneath your feet and you just get pulled in and it accelerates and goes down deeper and deeper. I mean, this is really a, a process of gaslighting. It's yeah. a process of creating. What you're describing is that in, in a sense, it, it kind of works the way military paranoia works because in military paranoia you're afraid of potential enemies so you get on guard you get defensive and then your defensiveness and your on guardness ends up provoking people and then they mm -hmm. react and then you point and say ah yes i was right there really are potential enemies out there and then the whole dynamic starts to happen so mm -hmm. you're saying that that is essentially the same thing that's happening in this psychiatric context that the program itself the program itself starts out with a kind of paranoia stance and then it ends up confirming its paranoia by pushing people into the role of the threat or the one who's different. And then they can point to them and say, aha, we were right all along. Mm. And then the, the kind of added twist to it is that because the treatments that they're giving people are um, supposedly these like preventative interventions, it means that actually this like this future threat of psychosis can never be falsified because there's this argument, well, once people start taking these preventative treatments, there's no evidence that it was never going to happen. So, so that's, that's kind of a, that's part of the spiraling that happens. So actually once people start engaging in treatment, their psychosis, their future psychosis becomes eternally real. And that's why this this prodromal movement and these kind of broader security industries are extremely problematic because they just spiral outwards and outwards and, and just create a bigger and bigger market for what well, they do. Well, what you're describing is something that's parallel with the war on terror because yeah. we know the terror is out there, so we have all this spending against terror. The terror hasn't happened. Well, it's because we're spending all this money on anti-terror. There's no way to actually confirm that you're preventing the terrorist threat because you're attacking it. So it's just this, this endless spiral that just continues and can, continues that's fueled by the paranoia without any kind of evidence because it's something that you're preventing from happening in the first place is what you claim to be doing. So there's no actual um, yeah. threat that's actually there necessarily. And also it's parallel in the way in which entrapment is used by the FBI and Homeland Security. That they actually create these kind of sting operations where people who were not necessarily going to be involved in a bombing plot, get drawn in to interest in bombing, but it's an FBI agent, an undercover agent, who's sort of creating this whole scheme. And then when they finally arrest the person, then they claim, well, they would have gone to do it on their own if we hadn't got them involved in us, which is, of course, impossible to, mm. to prove. And so it's a parallel kind of thing. It's, a, it's an imaginary paranoid logic that's in operation. Yeah, and that's where I kind of, yeah, after kind of going in and, and documenting all these cogs, that's, that's where I kind of started to turn towards in my, in, in, and in the book, because it was like, well, there, this is, this is driven by paranoia. What, what is driving these cogs? It's, it seems like it's paranoia. And so I come to kind of, yeah, theorize this paranoia and how it is, it, how it actually is like very present in science, including in psychology and these kind of prodromal movements. Um, and thinking about what are the kind of roots of this paranoia and how does it itself kind of enact this broader neo-colonial security state, which we see one instance of it in, in the war on terror. Would, would it be meaningful to think of it as maybe a combination of paranoia and profit? Because the pharmaceutical industry is very interested in this prodromal research and early psychosis because, it's, of course, it's about market expansion. Mm. And we see this also with military paranoia because yeah there's a, a psychological dynamic of the paranoia and seeing threats and seeing the enemy but then that becomes profitable to people who are expanding territory or people who are selling weapons or the whole defense industry the military industry and so this kind of this partnership between the paranoia 
and also the profit motive that creates this you know, unholy cycle that happens. And, and in doing that read, I, I came to think of myself as actually being paranoid. So huh. the, yeah, there were, I mean, the book does kind of lots of kind of loops and spirals and, and yeah, which made it, yeah, it just quite, <laughs> quite a creature to, to write, um, to let out. But what started off as kind of looking at how these prodromal scientists who are tr ostensibly trying to kind of document and capture paranoia are actually driven by their own paranoia. And in doing that kind of analysis, I came across the work of Eve Sedgwick, who's a queer theorist, and she talks about how critical scholarship tends towards its own paranoia. And uh, that we can kind of just document the world as this like oppressive force that just kind of gets bigger and bigger and worse and worse. And, it, and, it, and that in itself can be quite a suffocating experience for those of us who are trying to make change. And so I wanted to switch in the book from away from doing a paranoid reading towards doing what she calls a reparative reading that is looking for places of kind of hope and, and radicality in my case of, of decolonial possibility within paranoia itself. Uh, and that's where I started to connect experiences of paranoia with, um, with imagination. And that in itself emerged actually out of my own experience of um, encountering what's called the magical ideation scale. So the magical ideation scale, that sounds very interesting, but also a little sinister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, so it was in doing this work, looking at the kind of prodromal movement, I, I looked at a lot of the kind of measures that they used in order to assess if someone was pre-psychotic. And one of the kind of part of this um, kind of psychometric ancestry is the scale, magical ideation. It came out in the early 80s. Um, and so people can actually look this up online. It's actually a questionnaire or a, or a test to see how wildly and magically imaginative you are. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and problematically, I would say. That's how mm -hmm. they would describe it. How, <laughs> problematically. How problematically yeah. imaginative and spiritual one is. Yeah, so I, I love this scale, actually. It has 30 items on it. They're just kind of written as these statements and one is supposed to answer, say whether or not they think each statement is true or false. And then what, are the some end, of, what are some of the questions or statements? Uh, I believe that dreams can come true. Uh, I sometimes see messages for me in shop windows. Um, people behave so strangely. Sometimes I wonder if they're part of an experiment. The gestures that strangers make seem to influence me at times. Sometimes I have the feeling that a stranger is in love with me, even if I've never met them before. If reincarnation were true, it would explain some unusual experiences I've had. Rachel, I think I'm going to get a perfect score on that test, actually. I agree well, with every single one of those. <laughs> well, so did I. <laughs> so that's what kind of drew me. So I drew it in, and at first I answered, I answered yes or maybe, and I think the maybe is important, to... Uh -huh. Um, to 29 out of 30 of the statements. Oh, you almost got a perfect score. Yeah, Mr. and but now, now I, I would say 30 out of 30. Because yeah, <laughs> I've been convinced what, 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 by, the, by the 30th, yeah. What was the 30th one that, I, that the you were on the fence was, about? Um, the 30th was people behave so strangely, one wonders if they're part of an experiment. Oh, well, yeah, I, there's a giant yeah. experiment called putting a cell phone in everybody's pocket. I would call yeah. that a giant experiment. <laughs> yeah, or neoliberalism. So, yeah. right, or neoliberalism, yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah, so now I'm a 30 out of 30. I'm also a perfect score. So, but this scale, <laughs> I, li I literally started to carry it around with me. Like I printed it out. It was folded up. It was in my pocket. It was in my bag. I read it everywhere I went. I'd bring it out and talk with people about it. I, 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 it became my companion. Um, and it was my companion throughout this project. I found it very, very early on, very, so way before I went to the clinic. So what you're saying is that as you were writing this book, you, you kind of went a little mad yourself, it sounds like. Oh, very much. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. And I and and but that that madness became a, a very important kind of driving force. Because it is and, kind and of that's what I kind of come to think about in the book. Because I have to say that's one of the things I like about it. I mean, it's a kind of a crazy book. You've got so many things going on <laughs> in there. You just sort of blow up what any expectation would be of a kind of sober sociological or anthropological account, and you're you're sort of entering into the alternate reality 
of the things that you're studying, which makes it a very interesting uh, book that's constantly surprising as you read it. In fact, you've got some of your own um, art in here, which I think is really interesting. And a lot of it is very much a personal exploration, but it's also an imaginative and spiritual expression. It's, it's a very spiritual book. It's, it's sort of in the context of philosophy and, and uh, sociology and anthropology, but it's also a very spiritual and, and mystical book in a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah, and that, that was really important to me. I mean, it, it made me feel very vulnerable as a, as a scholar um, because it was, it's doing things that are usually pushed out of the academy. And, but to me, that it was part of kind of practicing or experimenting with walking the talk of the kind of arguments that I was making in the book. It's like if I was putting out this critique of a certain kind of rationality, a certain kind of whiteness, then mm -hmm. how could I try and, um, and, and interrupt those in my own process? Uh, so yeah, so I try to write more poetically, but also yeah, to engage in my own what um, imagination, which which I come to kind of theorize as a kind of otherworldly correspondence, and and I get that from thinking about paranoia and putting experiences like these prodromal experiences, including the, those experiences that are listed in the magical ideation scale, into conversation with um, with non-humans. So mm -hmm. one of the first kind of non-human that I, I kind of tr try to kind of welcome into the book is, is called Kwa'likwe, who's a, a Mesoamerican goddess of the serpent. Um, and the second kind of non, set of non-humans that I uh, kind of put these experiences into conversation with in the book are, are worms, actually, or worms. So between both of those, I, yeah, I come to think about how that, that paranoia that within paranoia is this potential for imagination for otherworldly correspondence and that that potential that capacity gets deformed or twisted into paranoia within a neo-colonial security state and so and so in terms of thinking about how paranoia is so omnipresent and so problematic in terms of these kind of post 9 11 politics of terror it's like is there some way that we can kind of return this this much more kind of radical uh, capacity or potential within paranoia. How can we make space for imagination within a, within a paranoid world? So instead of going into schools and interviewing people with the magical ideation scale and then inviting them to join performance arts troops or become poets or <laughs> study the history of surrealism or help them with their painting or help them with their music, we pathologize them and question them and start to see them as as sick. So we could create a space for imagination to flourish and express, but instead we symptomatize it and we turn it into, into something that's, that's ill or different to be suppressed. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people who would be given the magical ideation scale would probably be afraid to be to answer it honestly, because, uh, yeah. you know, whereas in fact, that's the world that I think we would want to live in is where people are invited to express their individuality and to find an outlet and to do kind of mad, unusual, mystical, spiritual things, because that's where the human spirit lies is an experimentation and creativity and that kind of freedom rather than corralling it and controlling it and putting it into these boxes and categories. Yeah. Yeah. I think the the fear that you mentioned there is, is really central to thinking about what we can mm -hmm. do or to, okay. yeah, or to what, what is it, what is a barrier to, to, yeah, to this kind of leading this, this capacity for these otherworldly correspondences to come out. Because it's a very courageous book that you wrote to putting all these different things together because people would, people would say, Oh, well, this isn't rigorous enough. This isn't real mm -hmm. social science. You're, this is, this is a, a PhD who's a little crazy and someone just gave her a book contract, like how did that happen? And uh, actually, no, you're actually making a stand for a different way of being in the world. Now, why is it that, help us understand this, why is it that someone who embraces imagination, who connects with ancestors, who connects with spirits and has a kind of a magical perspective on the world. Why is that a challenge to white supremacy? Why is that not just one flavor of whiteness, for example? Mm. That's a lovely question. Um, and I think that kind of, that 
that's where I'm kind of at now in terms of yeah where my kind of research and thinking is heading um so yeah earlier I spoke about how this person called Sylvia Winter talks about how colonization emerged out of this de-supernaturalization of our modes of being human so so to me like part of kind of challenging the the subsequent dehumanization that came out of colonization and that exists now and it enables all these these conditions of violence um, particularly for non-white bodies uh, is actually if we can yeah if we can welcome back in these more these modes of being human that that are supernaturalized right that are not where our connection to the cosmos is is, mm. is no longer severed so um so yeah for me like it's challenging challenging this idea of what's rational um which is as i see like embedded and absolutely central to science to academia to psychology is this idea of what's rational what's good scholarship you know uh, so if we can challenge that i i believe that we're challenging something that's at the core of coloniality and this kind of cosmological violence that continues today because you could say that, well, actually, you know, neoliberal capitalism is very imaginative. Turn on Netflix yeah. or go into a shopping mall. There's so much creativity. There's so much even surrealism and imagination and mm -hmm. spirit going on in the marketplace. We have so much wildness happening in our in our media and Hollywood. Isn't doesn't capitalism and white supremacy embrace imagination? Doesn't it embrace creativity as as one variety of expression of all that? diversity that comes under the bigger capitalist white supremacist umbrella? I think it embraces a kind of creativity and a kind of imagination, but the imagination that I've become interested in is this one that's more of like an otherworldly correspondence. So it's one, it's a way of kind of corresponding with a world that's outside of or beside our kind of what I think of as a colonial episteme. So this idea that whiteness in particular is an experience of having our heads like stuck in a certain way of seeing the world. And that way of seeing the world involves seeing the world as in the cosmos um, and as in other people as kind of as property. Um, and as something to be kind of to be controlled and something that can be an object of violence. Uh, and so I think that the kind of imagination and creativity that that we see within yeah, capitalism and neoliberalism is certainly not breaking that kind of hierarchy, but it's actually reinscribing it. So it's about commodities and products and brands and consumerism really is. And often people wouldn't necessarily think of that as connected to whiteness, but actually you're saying that that actually is the essence of whiteness is the history of capitalism and colonialism and consumerism yeah because it's connected to control it's connected to control and we should remember that the origins of whiteness in the united states is how people from europe who maybe had different ethnic identities as irish as polish as french as german as italian as greek all of them were brought under this single white umbrella in order to divide and conquer from mm. those who were brought over as african those who were brought over as slaves, African Americans, because there was this concern that the poor people are going to all get together. African Americans, Europeans are all going to get together and challenge the existing order. And so whiteness, at least in my understanding, was kind of like an insider club that creates you as allied to the power structure on the condition that you divide against and perpetuate the oppression of African Americans and keep the slavery system going. And that kind of persists today. It's a divide and conquer strategy, really. One of the, for me personally, and also in something I'm kind of exploring more in, in my kind of teaching and, and activism, is thinking about what are some other ways of doing whiteness that have maybe been pushed out of white supremacy. And one of those that's particularly connected to colonization is, um, is paganism and witchcraft. Hmm. So the, well, there was a kind of pre the 15th century, there were the witch hunts in Western Europe, which were very much used it, as to kind of roll out capitalism and roll out Christianity. Uh, and they, they involved yeah, the, the genocide of white women, poor white women, who were practice, practicing collective living, who were practicing 
uh, like sexual relationships kind of outside of the kind of outside of heteropatriarchy who were leading revolutions against the kind of the land owning elite and who were very much connected to the world around them to the cosmos and they were practicing and this all came together and kind of practicing a kind of magic including the magic of of midwifery itself of birth itself uh, and so these these women these white women were so threatening to the status quo and the rollout of capitalism that they needed to be wiped out and that that is Silvia Federici who's a Marxist kind of feminist she documents those witch hunts and how they were they are part of the story actually of colonization and um, because some many of the same practices that were used in the witch hunts were also used in the colonies and this kind of de-supernaturalization that I spoke of earlier um, that happened in the colonies was very much happening during the witch hunts as well. It was trying to um, cut off, create a kind of human that is cut off from their bodies, that is cut off from their flesh, that's cut off from the cosmos. And so for me as a white woman, returning to that, that ancestry as well is kind of one way to think about how to do whiteness differently today in a way that maybe can help to kind of shake the pillars of white supremacy. And what would your vision be of a new direction for psychology or psych or psychiatry? Or what would you like to see the survivor movement or the critical psychiatry movement doing to really engage with these issues in a, in a much better way? I would definitely like, I mean, to, this is a bold move, <laughs> but to see us try and maybe not use the kind of master's tools as Audre Lorde describes them of, mm. um, the, the way kind of empirical science and scholarship is expected to be. But if we kind of can start to develop these new kinds of sciences and new kinds of practices that welcome back the supernatural, that welcome back the flesh, the cosmos. Uh, and I also would like to see more kind of explicit collaborating with, yeah, with artists, with people who are kind of practitioners of imagination, um, and also with activists, with people who are trying to make kind of concrete change in the world. Because from my experience and then from talking with others, it's from actually trying to do things that I've learned the most. If we can start to kind of, in terms of doing decolonizing work and maybe other kinds of radical kind of politics or seeking other kinds of radical change is really looking at the world. I, I think it's more from use like a more kind of spiritual perspective, but mm. really seeing that there is this kind of this, this otherworldly potential that this other world is possible, not just in the future, but it's actually with us here and now um, that there is decolonial in the colonial. Um, and it's about kind of looking for those seeds and, and nourishing them collectively nourishing them. And Rachel, now that you've done this book, what are you, what are you doing now? What are you working on now? Um, I'm, I'm wanting to move more into doing this kind of psychology that engages much more explicitly with psyche, with breath, with spirit, um, particularly through the flesh. And I've kind of been inspired actually by some of my own ancestral work, which itself was triggered by a, a diagnosis that I got a couple of years ago of a kind of arthritis called ankylosing spondylitis. So oh. this, it's a kind of, um, this, the arthritis involves this kind of a lot of a discomfort in my joints and all, and the gradual kind of, and fragility in my bones and a gradual fusion of my spine. Um, oh. And I found out that this, arthritis was actually inherited through my settler ancestry in particular on my mum's side so those were well, my ancestors that were missionaries and and actually if you map the the kind of prevalence of this disease in the world it maps the british empire so i feel like i suddenly felt like actually in my body in my bones i literally had a kind of colonial like dis ease and then within in te Rau Māori, which is the indigenous language of new zealand the word iwi iwi it means kind of tribe but it also means bones and so I, i've started kind of uh i've started a project where i'm trying to learn how i can speak and like correspond do an otherworldly correspondence uh, with my bones to learn about white discomfort, white fragility, 
uh, what I call white fusion, which is a kind of refusal of feeling um, within, yeah, in, in order to kind of think about how whiteness connects to, to colonization and to coloniality. So, yeah, so it's kind of coming, it, it's effectively a project of thinking. Uh, eventually, it's thinking about whiteness as a kind of sickness uh, that we need to be, that we need to expel from our bodies, that we need to be healed from. Rachel, remind us uh, your, about your book and how can people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, well, my book is called Security, Colonialism, Paranoia and the War on Imagination. And people can get in touch with me by email. Um, so the address is rachel.liebert at gmail.com. That's R-A-C-H-E-L dot L-I-E-B-E-R-T at gmail.com. Rachel Jane Liebert, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. You've been listening to an interview with Rachel Jane Liebert. Rachel is a PhD lecturer in psychology at the University of East London in the UK. She collaborates with artists and activists on decolonizing and feminist works around madness and whiteness. She recently published the book, Psychurity, Colonialism, Paranoia, and the War on Imagination. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio host is Will Hall. Producer is Nina Packabush. Madness Radio is an affiliate of Madden America Radio, broadcasting on KBOO in Oregon, sponsored by Portland Hearing Voices and The Icarus Project, and syndicated on the Pacifica Network. Madness Radio is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio and at maddenamerica.com. <laughs>